the world of computers, a back door is a means of accessing a device or piece of software via an alternative entry point that allows one to bypass typical security measures and often, though not always, to do so in a subtle, undetected, and maybe even undetectable manner. While back doors can be built into hardware and software systems by the companies that make those devices and apps and bits of internet architecture, and while some governments and agencies, including the Chinese government and allegedly folks at the NSA, have at times installed back doors on relevant hardware and software for surveillance purposes, back doors are generally the domain of tech oriented criminals of various stripes most of whom make use of vulnerabilities that are baked into their targets in order to gain access, and then while inside the administrative components of a system, they write some code or find some kind of management lever meant to give the company or other entity behind the target access for non-criminal repair and security purposes, and then that allows them to continue to gain access in the future, like using a rock to prop open a door after you've gained access to a secure facility. Concerns over a back door being installed in vital systems is fundamental to why the United States and European governments, among others, have been so hesitant to allow Chinese-made 5G hardware into their wireless communication systems. There's a chance that with the aid or perhaps just at the prodding of the Chinese government, such hardware or the software it utilizes could contain a Trojan or other packet of code hidden from view and hard-coded into the devices in some covert manner. These devices could also harbor even smaller devices, indistinguishable from hardware that's meant to be there, that would allow them to do the same via more tangible means. Though there were almost certainly other economic and technology dominance reasons for the clampdown on products made by Chinese tech company Huawei, beginning in earnest in 2012, and escalating rapidly during the U.S. Trump administration, that process was at least ostensibly tied to worries that a Chinese company, prone to spying and stealing foreign tech already, might incorporate itself into fundamental global communications architecture. It was underpricing everybody else, offering whiz-bang new high-end 5G technology at a discount, sometimes even at a loss, and supposedly, if the accusations are true at least, doing so as part of a bigger plan to tap into all sorts of vital aspects of these systems, giving them unparalleled access to all communications, basically, but also giving them the ability, supposedly, to shut down those systems with the press of a button in the event that China wants or needs to do so at some point. If they ever decide to invade Taiwan, for instance, and want to distract the Western world until that invasion is complete by taking down the internet, or if they just want to make rallying a defense against such an invasion or similar act a lot more difficult. Other confirmed and successfully deployed backdoors have been found in all sorts of products, ranging from counterfeit Cisco network products like routers and modems, some of which were installed in military and government facilities in the U.S., back in 2008, before they were recognized for what they were, to things like Microsoft software, WordPress plugins, and a brand of terminals that manage the data sent along fiber optic cables, mostly for high-speed internet purposes. Again, in some cases, the entities making these products do install what are literally or essentially backdoors in their hardware and software because it allows them to help their customers retrieve lost passwords, fix issues after the sale, install security updates, and other beneficent things like that. But backdoors of any shape or size are generally considered to be major security vulnerabilities, as stealing a password or getting access to a vital terminal could then grant someone with bad intentions access to absolutely everything, giving them godlike control over all aspects of a customer's information and operations, or maybe even all of the company's customer information and operations. And that creates a single point of failure that most companies want to avoid, because at a certain point, there's no way to prevent a truly determined and well-funded foe if they know the payout for 
investing in accessing that one terminal or getting that single password would be that substantial. What I'd like to talk about today is a long-term effort to do exactly that. The target, in this case, being small, but the potential payoff of backdooring it being pretty much as big as you can imagine. You're listening to Let's Know Things. I'm Colin Wright. Learn more about Let's Know Things, subscribe to receive free email updates, and or become a supporter to receive monthly bonus episodes at letsknowthings.com. XZUtils is the name of an open source data compression utility, which means that it squishes data in such a way that no information is lost, but so that big files and other packets of information become smaller, and that makes it faster and easier and cheaper to send those bundles of data from place to place. XZ is popular in part because it's effective, in many cases outperforming other free alternatives like GZIP and BZIP2. But it also supports an older compression model called LZMA, and it exists in the public domain, which means it is incredibly inexpensive to use, free for most purposes. It's especially popular in Linux and other Unix-like systems. And in practice, that means that it's used across these systems so that when data is moved from place to place, within an operating system, for instance, it's compressed and then decompressed, putting less pressure on the systems themselves, almost like reducing the weight of everything that you have to carry throughout the day without any reduction in quality or to the nature of the books and bags and laptops and other things that you're hauling around all the time. Even small reductions in that weight could make a big difference in the strain on your body over time. And this utility accomplishes the same for the data contained within the systems that use it. So this software utility is super useful, it's free to anyone who wants it, and it's better than a lot of other options. And it has thus been baked into a bunch of fundamental computer infrastructure including most Unix-like systems. And that's important for a lot of reasons, but the most immediately concerning issue is that the vast majority of servers that run the tech world, basically all the major tech companies and all of the companies they work for, manage their servers with Linux. XZ is not just important for folks who have laptops running Linux then, it is also vital to the functionality of huge chunks of the internet. Stats from the past few years show that about 96.3% of the top million websites run on Linux servers, and a substantial amount of non-web serving servers do as well. All of which sets the stage for the hubbub that arose on March 29, 2024, when a Microsoft employee named Andres Freund announced that, after looking into a decrease in performance, in a version of Linux called Debian, a distinction between how fast it should have been going and how fast it was going, of about 500 milliseconds. And that minor slowdown in Debian bugged him enough that he decided to look into what newer experimental versions of XZ utils were doing to the Debian operating system that he was working with. And after looking into that issue, he announced that he had discovered a backdoor in XZ that was causing errors in a memory debugging tool built into the software, and that was causing it to use more CPU power than Debian otherwise would have used. So he announced this discovery, reported it to an open source security mailing list to make sure it is known amongst the right people, and that in turn alerted the folks who were experimentally incorporating this new build of XZ into their software. As it turns out, this back door had it been implemented in all this software and spread across the servers that manage the majority of the web, would have granted whomever controlled it the ability to alter the behavior of the local instance of the Secure Shell Protocol, or SSH, which is what protects servers while they operate on open networks, like the internet. The degree to which this would have damaged the web as it exists today cannot be overstated. This problem was given a Common Vulnerability Scoring System ranking, which rates the alarmingness of software issues based on how much damage they could potentially cause. 
which helps computer security professionals figure out which problems to address at first. It was given a score of 10, which is the highest possible score. In theory, this would have granted the person or other entity with backdoor access the ability to get into essentially any server touching the internet with full administrator privileges, making all that information transparent to them, providing them all the information those companies and other entities have about users and passwords and banking information, everything everyone has ever posted on social media, all their private communications, research and technology secrets that might be touching those servers. It's really just boggling thinking about how much damage could have been caused by the right person or people, as such a backdoor would basically do away with most of the security measures they might encounter while trying to infiltrate and even take over essentially any website or app. Because it was discovered by Freund, though, and because he got word out to the right people as quickly as he did, the cybersecurity world was able to pivot pretty quickly, advising everyone who had implemented these test versions to roll back to earlier versions of the relevant software. And the folks behind XZ quickly released updated versions of the utility that removed the back door. This also triggered a response in the wider software world as many developers have started to reduce damage future similar back doors would be able to cause by reducing the connections and dependencies that the back door took advantage of in order to do what it did to function. So this was a big enough deal that even something as arcane as compression utilities and SSH became front page news around the world. But arguably one of the most interesting aspects of this story is what we know about the person or people who seem to have installed this back door. Someone, or a group of someones, going by the name Gia Tan, alongside an array of sock puppet accounts, fake accounts with different names that they also managed, started to contribute to the maintenance and development of XZ, which is common in the open source world. That's part of what makes open source software and systems so powerful and often desirable, despite typically not having much in the way of funding or official support from big name companies. They are often passion projects maintained by maybe just one or a few or a handful of dedicated developers that do it in their spare time. In 2021, this entity that became known as Giatan started contributing to open source projects and then contributed a patch to XZ via its mailing list. Around that same time, several people who had not been seen in this project's community previously started to complain that it wasn't being updated fast enough and arguing that another maintainer should be brought on board to help it move along faster. This Giatan character then started making a lot more contributions to the project, all of them seemingly innocuous and pretty helpful, though in retrospect at least one of them changed a function that would have detected the more malicious changes that they ultimately submitted later. In February of 2024, Tan submitted changes for the new version of XZ Utils that incorporated a back door, and groups of people in this larger open source community, possibly sock puppet accounts as well, started telling the developers who run Debian, Ubuntu, and Red Hat, all popular versions of Linux, that they should incorporate this new version with those backdoor incorporating changes into their operating systems, trying to spread it further faster, basically. There are strong suspicions, but little evidence at this point at least, that Gia Tan and those other sock puppet accounts were run by a well-funded and skilled, probably government-backed, hacking group, like one of the entities that often work as proxies for Russia's SVR, their intelligence agency that tends to support local hacking groups to do this sort of dirty work. Though again, we cannot say that with any certainty, as a lot of government-backed hacking groups could pull off something like this with enough patience, years worth of patience, and it's still possible that this was just a single hacker who saw a soft target and the potential for a huge payoff if it all worked out. That said, because of the approach this threat actor, whomever they actually are, took to target this utility, and because of how close they got to doing what they intended to do, which would have been devastating, probably world-changing in some ways, because of that, the relationship that big tech and governance 
has with the open source world is being reassessed because often the folks running these projects are just individual people doing all this important work in their free time. And because of how the tech world has evolved, huge swaths of the internet and other vital infrastructure are reliant on these single person passion projects that are potential targets for co option, or as seems to have been the case here, using what's called social engineering to manipulate the folks behind these projects, which can then give more access to all the stuff they manage and thus the things that rely on the stuff they manage. All that power would be handed to entities that want to cause harm, and they are softer targets because of how isolated and unsupported, very often, these maintainers of these projects tend to be. Again, and this cannot be emphasized enough, we just barely dodged a bullet here, and the only thing that prevented a huge amount of potential destruction was the effort of another single person who was almost on a whim, hacking away on a finicky little problem they decided to look into, and who thus stumbled upon this issue right before it reached a scale that would have been truly problematic. And all of these issues were arguably the result of someone who found themselves in the position of maintaining, more or less solo, a utility that became vital to global cybersecurity, and which thus made them the target of a sophisticated hacking and social engineering campaign. The book I'd like to recommend today is called The Underworld, Journeys to the Depths of the Ocean by Susan Casey. This book is written by the author of several ocean-related books. She's written about sharks, she's written about waves, and in reading this book you truly get the impression that she's an absolute nerd for this subject, and her passion comes across throughout the entirety of the book and that enthusiasm is contagious. Now, this book is kind of just an overview of the topic in question about oceanography and marine biology and marine geology, talking about some of the myths and legends associated with the bottom of the ocean and traversing the ocean, but also discussing how it's changing as the climate is changing, how things like industrial wide-scale fishing is changing the ecosystems that live in different portions of the ocean, and some new concerns that we're looking at right now and considering as a globe-spanning civilization, like whether or not to mine for some of the vital resources that we need to electrify the planet, if we should mine the bottom of the ocean in order to pick up some of the resources that seem to be there. Now, if any of that sounds interesting to you, consider picking up a copy of The Underworld by Susan Casey. You can subscribe to receive email updates, find show notes, and other such content, and support this show financially, receiving additional bonus episodes as a thank you at letsknowthings.com. Learn more about me and my work at colin.io. Subscribe to my other news-focused podcast, One Sentence News, wherever you get your pods, or at onesentencenews.com. And say howdy on social media. I'm at Colin is my name on Instagram and Twitter and Colin Wright on Facebook and YouTube. Thank you so much for listening. I'm Colin Wright, and I'll talk to you again next week. Mm-hmm.